Today we are very happy to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Kemal Sibar, who is uh, a chair professor in uh, the Turkish program in Yale University. Uh, we, uh, we are happy to, uh, to welcome him because he is coming within the, uh, uh, the cooperation program uh, with our university and uh, Indiana University. Uh, he uh, he is also uh, he, he has published uh, uh, many books. Among uh, among them, I had this uh, an impressive uh, anthology, uh, an anthology of uh, Turkish literature, and also. Uh, Another book about uh, poetics of the Ottoman court, and another one which is about uh, Turkish folklore and oral literature. And you know that we have a, a, a very uh, interesting uh, professor today, and uh, I'm sure you're eager to uh, to listen to his uh, lecture. He's uh, uh, going to speak to us about uh, women's love lyric in Ottoman Turkey. So I'll let you uh, listen to Professor Kemal Stilai. Listen and enjoy his lecture. Um, for some reason, I cannot sit and lecture, so I'll just try to perform here a little. But first, I would love to thank uh, Fatima for the uh, lovely presentation. I don't think I deserve these words, but thank you so much. Uh, also, uh, I am very grateful to Professor uh, Dries Wawisha for making uh, this visit to Morocco my very first visit here possible. Uh, also, if I could thank uh, the entire nation of Morocco, I have not seen a hospitality of this sort for a long time. I'm very happy, I'm grateful. I would also like to thank the Moroccan government for not uh, requiring visa from Turkish citizens. That was quite some experience for me. I was shocked. So apparently there is one country in the world which is not suspicious of Turks. I was very happy. Uh, well, today I'm going to talk about an upcoming book of mine. Actually, today I will cover more Ottoman women poets than I am going to uh, deal with in my book. I am focusing on one figure called Mithi Khatun, but I would like you to get a general idea of how women wrote poetry uh, during the Ottoman centuries in Turkey. Uh, consciously, I didn't want to use the term the Ottoman Empire because it's, you know, uh, very well that included many other countries, uh, not just Turkey. But I'm only going to uh, talk about women poets who wrote in Turkish or in Ottoman Turkish. Uh, I have actually some questions from colleagues. What language was used during the Ottoman centuries? Uh, it was uh, Turkish, but Ottoman Turkish. It was a court language, not really that much spoken, but a written language. Uh, also, please accept my apologies that uh, I'm speaking in English here, uh, talking about Turkish li uh, literature to a Moroccan audience. I wish I could do this in Arabic, uh, inshallah, next year. <laughs> Uh, how should I start? I'm, if you don't mind, I'm going to read a paper to you. Uh, but let me give you a little introduction of how this uh, interest in me started with women's writing. I was an undergraduate student. I'm sure many of you are undergraduates here. I was curious about uh, whether there were women poets writing in Turkish during the Ottoman centuries. I knocked, knocked on one of the doors of uh, one of the greatest professors of classical literature in Turkey and said, Hocam, Ya Ustazi, I would like to work on women's poetry. He just kicked me out from his office, said, don't you have anything better to do? You know, there are a lot of great men poets, thousands of them. What are you going to do dealing with second class poetry? That's how he put it. Uh, well, as a rebellious student, I continue to think about the place of male or female discourse in Ottoman court poetry. I am at the present stage unable to present uh, satisfactory answers to every question that I have been asking about these women. However, I am constantly going back 
uh, in my mind to the initial meeting with my professor and constantly agreeing and disagreeing with him. Mine is not a truly revisionist or postmodernist reading of the literary heritage of these women. I am by the same token not trying to create an literature feminine which in its true sense never existed in the divans of Ottoman women poets. On the contrary, I feel quite reluctant to accept, for example, many of the theoretical assumptions of some leading French feminists, such as Hélène Sixou and Louise Irigaret, whose main concentration seems to be a supposed direct relationship between woman's body and her writing. They believe that woman's experience in the Western world has been the target of a systematic uh, male repression, and in order to challenge this historical male position, they turn to feminite and endeavor to deconstruct language, philosophy, psychoanalysis, and many other social practices. They try to establish their difference and reflect this directly in their writing, producing experimental text feminine. These French feminists seem to argue that indeed women do have a different voice articulated in a different language. They try to locate this difference within the overall discussion of power relations. Alain Sixou and Luz Irigade paid special attention to the uh, uh, attention to the relationship between woman, woman's body and her language. They try to deconstruct the phallocentric control over women, and both have experimented in the expression of repressed female identity and desire through a different language, a language which has been called écriture féminine. Irigaret argues that women do not have only one single sex organ, but several all over their bodies. Since sexual pleasure can be stimulated through almost every part of their bodies, this multiplicity is directly reflected in their language, especially when their lips speak together. However, their essentialist and idealist approach to female desire and its representation in language has been sharply criticized because it seems to assume that every woman's sexuality and culture is a monolithic phenomenon. Sandra Gilbert and Suzanne Gubar also share certain similarities to Sixou and Irigaré in their approach to women's writing, through, uh, though they belong to a different school of feminism. It is a, a, is a pen and metaphorical penis. They start the mad woman in the attic with this provocative question, going on to show that the patriarchal ideology defines artistic creativity as a male quality. They believe that the poet's pen is more than figuratively a representation of his penis, and the penis becomes the symbol of a dominant ideology which has systematically oppressed the woman in her writing. For them, in patriarchal Western society, the author of a text is like a father, an aesthetic patriarch, whose pen is an instrument of generative power like his penis. <laughs> From this pen penis problematization, Gilbert and Gubar delve into the very world of author and its relationship with the phenomenon of authority. They define the poet as a paternalistic ruler of the fictive world he has created, and he is, in this sense, no different from the image of God the Father. God the Father creates the cosmos and writes the book of nature. A powerful patriarchal vocabulary dominates the, uh, the total phenomenon of writing. Problematizing these very fundamental concepts of writing, Gilbert and Gubar question and indeed challenge the patriarchal theory of literature itself, raising the following question. If the pen is a metaphorical penis, with what organ can females generate texts? They try to find a distinctive female voice in the works of 19th century women writers in England and America, and discover the efforts of those women who assaulted, revised, deconstructed, and reconstructed the images of women which they inherited from the literature of the male. Toril Moi, on the other hand, argues that Gilbert and Gubar's wish to discover a true female authorial voice as the essential of all texts written by women puts them into a position which in the end turns out to be the female version of a new phallocentric criticism. Moi's suggestion 
as a means to deconstruct the patriarchal practice of authority is to turn to Ronald Barthes, the death of the author, and the accept of the accept the notion of multiplicity of writing as an alternative to Gilbert and Gobar's true female voice, or in Moa's words, a miraculously intact femaleness. She criticizes Gilbert and Gobar's attempt to postulate a real woman hidden behind the patriarchal textual facade, as well as Anglo-American feminist criticism's attempt in general to transform all texts written by women into feminist texts because they may always, and without exception, we have to embody somehow and somewhere the author's female rage against patriarchal oppression. In The Mad Woman in the Attic, Moa tries but cannot find the answer to, the fun to this fundamental question. How did women manage to write at all, given the relentless patriarchal indoctrination that surrounded them from the moment they were born? And Rosalind Jones, in her writing the body towards an understanding of literature feminine, sharply criticizes the French position and finds its whole premise theoretically fuzzy and phallocentric, this time coming from the female side. She contends that this kind of feminist position is too essentialist and idealist, and that it assumes the existence of a universal female sexuality based on the French experience. She powerfully argues that sexual identity does not take shape at all in isolation or in a physical context. The child becomes male or female in a social environment. What John suggests is a different, different feminist model that takes place into account the more complex social and ideological power relations which for centuries have controlled and dominated the position of women and their production. As she says, how can one libidinal voice or the two vowel lips so startlingly presented by Irigave speak for all women? By dealing with the medieval court poetry of Arman Turkish woman here, I shall try to contribute to Anne Rezolan Jones's findings, which provide an alternative to the French feminist deconstructionists and their idealist construct of femininity and female writing. In her recent book, The Currency of Eros, Jones concentrates on the love lyrics of eight European Renaissance women poets and attempts to explain how they gain access to and acceptance in the reigning male-defined and male-dominated poetic discourses despite all of the ideological pressures of the patriarchal society which were working against them. Jones develops her analysis of these women poets from the theory of negotiation, which she defines as the range of interpretive positions through which subordinated groups respond to the assumptions encoded into dominant cultural forms and systems of representation. In this theory of negotiation, there is always a degree of give and take between the subordinated groups and the dominant entities. In that, production and reception is a two-way circuit, especially in systems uh, in which imitation is a fundamental principle of composition. Building upon Stuart Hart's definition of possible viewer positions, Jones delineates three different categories of negotiation which involve differing degrees of challenges to or disturbances of the dominant systems of production. Her first category, the dominant hegemonic viewer position, is defined as one which receives and reproduces a public text obediently. However li limited in its scope, this position still destabilizes the gender systems since a woman whose claim to public language was prohibited because of her gender, uses that discourse and its prestige to validate her entry into the stage. Her second category involves a negotiated position in which the subordinated group accepts the ruling ideology inscribed into a text but particularizes and transforms it in order to serve a different group in more local and restricted situations. For instance, a woman who writes love lyric within traditionally male-oriented, male-defined symbolic systems, makes certain local modifications 
while still accepting the global framework of the discourse. She creates a negotiation code which is uh, sustained by its differential and unequal relations to the discourse and its logic of power. The third and most challenging category is the oppositional position from which the ideological message and force of the reigning code is re-articulated. Uh, that is pulled out of its dominant frame of reference and subversively inserted into an alternative frame of reference. Based on my going efforts to decipher the Aramean Turkish divans written by women, the first two stages of negotiation that Jones describes seems uh, seem well suited to explain how the Ottoman woman poets of the medieval period, which in our case started around the 13th century and continued until the late 19th century, managed to write love lyric in literary circles which were dominated by male authors and their aesthetic, social, and ideological values. The third stage is more readily observed in the writings of the first modern Ottoman woman writers of the late 19th century and the early 20th century. Here I will only talk about the medieval authors and these first two positions of negotiation. Again, I would like to clarify that I do not use the uh, term medieval in a Western understanding. If we are finding uh, features of medieval uh, literature, let's say in the 18th or 19th centuries in Turkey, then I won't hesitate to use the term medieval. Uh, just like all the other theories. We cannot just borrow one theory created somewhere in Paris or somewhere in, in London and say, here you go, we can just, you know, put this theory and understand our culture. No, we should constantly try to test them and challenge them. It's not just a matter of simple copying of what the others did. We have to contextualize these things. We should start with a very few uh, a few very general observations regarding Arabic lyric poetry and, its, uh, and the traditional conventions which continued to hold sway throughout the Ottoman centuries. It was predominantly defined according to Persian classical poetic models and adopted much of the same Persian poetic vocabulary and imagery. It was an idealized discourse which portrayed a love of fantasy quite cut off from any grounding in the real world. Much like the various love lyric traditions in Europe, described by Jones, Ottoman love poetry was a tradition defined by and for men. In this poetry, woman was the silent and distant object of male desire. The beloved is rarely given a voice with which to articulate her own experiences and emotions in the love relationship. Rather, they always pass through the filter of the male lover and his own gender-specific perspective and interpretations. For the woman who, who dared to venture into the poetic discourse as a poet, there were certain essential obstacles. The tradition provided few or no models for her to emulate. There are only a dozen or so documented woman poets from the 19th, uh, 15th to the 19th century who wrote within the divan tradition. And in fact, almost every kind of existing writing, starting with the holy book itself, was the product of male minds. Any written portrait of women and their emotions, experiences, in fact, their very definition as women, came from the male-oriented constructs. Indeed, this situation in love poetry is in large a part of the reflection of the general structures of medieval society in both the East and the West which was not only silenced women in society through institutionalized religions and other means of power, but most of the men as well. It is in the love lyric that the power of the male voice and of male dominance is reflected most clearly. Jones describes a situation in European Renaissance literature, which bears striking similarities to medieval Ottoman lyric poetry. She says, in fact, love poetry centralizes sociosexual differences as no other literary mode does. The narrator of epic or prose romance is not necessarily marked by gender. The speaker, the speaker in erotic poetry always is. If women are disempowered by their placement in a visual and symbolic order structured around men's fantasies, 
and if worldly as well as verbal power is always at stake in reigning love discourses, then a woman love poet is certain to disarticulate and re remobilize the sexual economy of her culture. Renaissance gender decorum clothes women off from the literary genres, most privileged because most publicly oriented. Epic, tragedy, uh, political and philosophical theory, but love rhetoric as an ostensibly private discourse could conceivably be allowed them. In practice, however, the ideological matrix that associated open speech with open sexuality in women made love poetry an especially transgressive genre for them. The genre of a semi-private sphere that broke down certain categories. The woman love poet exposing desire for a man who was not her husband to the gaze of a mass readership was a public woman, a term that in the 19th, 16th century in Europe meant a whore. During the majority of the almost 600 year reign of Arabic poetry, originality, individual viewpoint, personal outbring of emotions, and sincerity were not the goals of the poet, at least insofar as uh, he adhered to the classical canon and to the traditional models. Of course, Arabic poets felt emotions, experienced or longed for love, and had personal opinions. The point is nevertheless, that the tradition left little space, presented few models by which they could articulate their personal life in this poetry with a canonized language. What was speaking during the Middle Ages in Persian Ottoman poetry or Ottoman Turkish poetry was not an individual man, but rather than a part, but rather a particular social class, which reflected the voice and dominance of more than one man. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to get some. Of course, which seemed by definition to necessitate her silence, her obedience, and her inaccessibility. That was a discourse which was constructed by the male poet, naturally enough, reflecting his learning, his words, his thinking, his beliefs, and his desires. Woman was defined as the object of, of desire. How was a woman poet to assume the role of a speaking subject, the active agent and pursuer of love? Who were those Adam and women who had the privilege of being able to write love poetry or to even write period? How did they come to be literate individuals, a quality that very few people enjoyed during the Ottoman centuries. Before the 20th century cultural revolutions, uh, probably uh, being optimistic, probably 10% of the Ottoman Turkish society was able to read and write. We know from the existing, source, existing sources that all women poets had some kind of fam family access to the Ottoman high cultures. Their fathers or husbands belonged to either Askeri or Ulama classes of the empire. Some had fathers who were governors, military judges, chief astronomers, or Sheikh al Islams. Some had poet brothers. And the majority of them came from Istanbul, the cultural and political center of the empire. Once the Ottoman woman had gained access and privilege to the power of the written world, she had to find some means in order to be recognized as a legitimate divan poet. Since she had few or no female models to follow, she tried to imitate the male discourse in the hopes of establishing herself as a poet. This is exactly what Anne Rosalind Jones uh, is describing in her first stage of negotiation. You imitate. So people, the, the male poets, uh, start believing that you are capable of doing this. It's a very smart uh, introduction to the club. Let us now look at the gazel, and we all know what gazel is, right? Love lyric. <coughs> By Fitnat Hanum, who was born in Istanbul and died there in 1780. Let me see if you recognize some Arabic words in this Turkish poem, right? 
Bağda güller ruhun seyriyle hayran oldu hep. Kakülün reşkiyle sümbüller perişan oldu hep. Bir nigahı naza şayan olduk ama neyleyen. Sinemüz amaç gahı tir mucgan oldu hep. Arızı alün senin en goncele bittüm hayal. Hane-i hatırına reşk-i gülistan oldu hep. Çaşni bahş oldu olken merahat bezme çün. Sağar ömeyi aksi lanli ile inemekdan oldu hep. Fitna dol şiirinde hem nutka gelin cenaz ile. Feyzi güftar ile alem şekkeristan oldu hep. Just in case you didn't get this horrible Arabic. <laughs> in the garden, the roses were all bewildered, and they watched your cheek. Jealous of your love locks and hyacinths were all distraught. We deserved one attractive glance, but alas, what to do? Our bosom is constantly the target of eyelash arrows. Oh, you, with rosebud lip, I imagined your crimson cheek, and it became the envy of every rose in the dwelling of my memory. You give savor to the party, oh lovely mine of salt, for the cup of wine is but a salt bowl reflecting your ruby lip. Oh fitna, when that sweet mouth begins to speak alluringly, blessed by abundant speech, the world all becomes a field of sugar. There is nothing in this poem which explicitly reveals uh, to us the gender of the poet. Turkish, the language, does not show gender in the third person, singular or plural. Thus, there are no grammatical gender markers here. The only indication comes in the last couplet when the author names herself obeying the requirement of this poetic uh, form. No do the images in the poem articulate a woman's desire for a man beloved, as we might expect. Fitnat Hanum employs some of the most common clichés of Persia Aramun poetry, clichés that traditionally were, uh, were used to refer exclusively to female beloved. For example, she mentions the roses, güller, as a metaphor for the blushing cheek, ruh, of the beloved. The lover as being the target of the arrows of the beloved eyelashes, Tiri Bujgan, is a common image of this tradition, as is the wine glass, Sawarame, and ruby lips, Lai, relationship. The last couplet is also built upon the well known image of the beloved's mouth as a source of sweetness and fertility to the lover and his uh, world. I have already mentioned that the classical tradition had made it very difficult for an individual to represent his own voice in this poetry. And for a woman, it was most of the time well nigh impossible to reflect her femininity in this medium. One has to look beyond the questions of explicitly reflected gender and give up trying to figure out whether the metaphors for the beloved seem to describe a man or a woman. These metaphors, these images, this vocabulary, this poetic structure are all being used because the male design tradition dictated the poet to use them, to follow what other poets had used before. Fitnat Hanım, as a woman poet, is doing precisely the same thing as many men poets would have normally done by repeating the common metaphors and images of the beloved. The following is another ghazal by Fitnat Khan, where some other common clichés of Persia Adman poetry once again articulated. Ahun ale ol shehi bidad ta'sir eylemez, bir nigehle budili viran ta'mir eylemez. Qaddune meyletmeyenler aşık-ı azadedir, zülfü nasadilleri derbendi zencir eylemez. Bir nigehle karını uç şartın eylersin devamı. Gamze-i aşık koşun muhtaç-ı şemşir eylemez. Vasılı canan olur hamuş olan pervane beş. Ateş-i aşkın o kim nadana takdir eylemez. Hane-i kalbüm harap etti tegafül fitneta. Bir nigehle bu dili viranı tahmir eylemez. Sighs and mourning have no effect on that tyrant sultan. 
She won't even spare a glance to fix this ruined heart. Those not inclined toward your body are free lovers. Their hearts are not changed by fast by, uh, by the like of your charms. With but one look, you put pay to your lover's lives. Your lover-killing glance has no need of a symmetry. Union with the beloved comes to one silent as a mouth who makes no report to the ignorant on the fire of passion for her. Of it not, her or his indifference has destroyed my heart dwelling. She won't even spare a glance to fix this ruined heart. Of the beloved, Khad, the beloved's long hair, which always tries to chain and capture the lover, Zuf, the gaze of the beloved, which aims to kill the lover, Gamzeli Aoshik Kosh, the beloved's lack of attention for the lover, Tagalafül, and so forth, all reflect the ecriture masculine of the divan tradition. Again, there is nothing that is specifically feminine about the speaking voice in this poem, except the very name Fitnat. As is the case with the majority of the poems written by Ottoman woman poets, Fitnat here adopts the voice of the traditional male lover and all the emotions, attributes, and expressions associated with this person. But even Fitnat Hanum is aware of the fact that what she is talking about owes very little uh, to her own feminine identity. And that is, she is employing all these words of female male fantasies just to prove to the canon that she is indeed <coughs> capable of writing the one poetry. She strives to show that she has read and mastered all the necessary tools of classical poetry. The following is perhaps the clearest indication of her consciousness of having to meet the requirements of the canon. Gülşeni vasfeylemekten ruyu canandır garaz, süngüli yad etmeden gisuyu canandır garaz. Düştü dil sevdayı hatta arzuyu lalile, hızra peyrev olmadan çün ağlı hayvandır garaz. Ey tabibi can, nuş yuşe ve eninin aşıkın, Derdini arz etmeden tedbir eder mandır garaz. Gül sitanın anmadan şebbü ve servüler gitsün. Zülf-i müşkin, haddi bala, çeşmi fettan dur garaz. Fitnata bi şüphe idrak eyler erbab-ı sühan. Böyle nazmı sadeden tertibi divanıdır garaz. The only reason, she says, to describe the rose garden is the face of the garaz. The only reason to mention the hyacinths is the beloved's laughs. The heart has fallen into a black passion for the dark down on his face. The water of eternal life is the only reason to follow Hizr into darkness. O oh, doctor of Alur, listen to the groans of your lovers. Hope of treatment is the only reason to tell the ones to tell of one's pains. The only reason to mention the garden is its wallflower, cypress, and narcissus is to call your musky locks, your tall body, your seductive eye. All fit not. Doubtless, those who know poetry will understand it. The only reason for such simple verse is to compile a divan. You know how a divan is compiled, right? Divan, uh, poetry collection. You have to have the coffee and wine, right? And you need to use certain uh, letters in the Arabic alphabet. She says, the only reason to compose such a simple, horrible poetry, so I can have a complete divan. Yes, on the one hand, Fitnat Hanan wants to arrange a divan, a poetry collection representing every letter of the Arabic script in the rhyme, the kafiye. But on the other hand, she is giving the message to the male masters of classical poetry that she does know what Gülşen, Ruyu Canan, Sümbül, Gisuyu Canan, Hat, Arzu Yulan, Kız, Ağla Hayvan, Tabibi Naz, Şebbu, Ser, Nergis, Zülfü Müşkin, Kadı Bala, Çeşmi Fettan, and other expressions mean, and how they are used to be used in poetry. But by calling what she has done is a simple plain verse. 
She also seems to challenge the tradition by exposing the mechanical nature of the rules and conventions governing these poetic forms, she expresses criticism as to the constraints which they impose. Yet the criticism is presented as humble self-criticism, which makes it safer and less threatening. Here the woman poet tries to reproduce produce a text following the male design poetic rules and values, thus creating a negotiated position with the male canon. By obeying the tradition, she sacrifices the expression of her female voice and her experience, but only, but at the same time, disturbs the male discursive establishment by gaining access to the traditional gendered power of that discourse. Another aspect of her love lyrics bears striking similarity to that of the men poets, namely her use of wine and wine related imagery. Although she is a well-bred, upper-class Muslim woman, Fitnat Hanum does not hesitate to talk about wine, the wine glass, intoxication, and similar themes that were used by the male elite for centuries, despite the religious prohibition against drinking, drinking wine. Here are a few examples from her divan. Def'i khumara isteresen çare ey gönül, ben bildigüm ilaj heman bal edursan. O oh heart, if you wish to remedy the morning after his woe, I suggest you take as cure the wine that caused it. You know, you drink at night and wake up in the morning, you have a headache. The medieval poet suggests that you drink a little more in the morning. Neşve-i can muhabbetle gönülcü şeyler, çekilen derdü gamı cümle feravu şeyler. The heart boils up at the cup of affection's intoxicating scent, and the pains and griefs it's, it suffered by everyone who happened. In a new fret, she says, Aksi çeşmun görecek camı meyna biçre, sandılar nergisi terdür, gülü şal lav biçre. When they saw your eye reflected in a limp, limpid cup of wine, they thought, it, they thought it a must narcissus within a dura threshold. Men poets who might have attracted criticism for talking so much about wine could always fall back on the, on the mystical interpretations of these images, and the stronger excuse perhaps that the tradition called for such images. Nevertheless, women who use images, these images, run a greater risk of attracting attention and criticism from the society. Similar usage of these wine-related images, used so often by men, as well as those I have been citing, can be found in the divans of all Ottoman women poets, from Zeynep Khatun, 1447, to Leyla Hanım, 1847, to Sheref Hanım, 1861. All of them use the conventional images of Dabrilic poetry without troubling uh, the definitions of gender roles which were inscribed within the images themselves. This poetry was very specific in assigning to men the active and eloquent role of subject as subject of love and to women, the passive and silent role as the object of love, the distant, idealized beloved. And yet, these women who adopted the persona of the male poet lover were, to some extent, at least, renouncing for themselves that silent, passive role of the beloved. This element, therefore, must be seen as a disturbance, a transgression, however timid, of the canon and of the roles it assigned to a woman. Sheref Hanım says, Shebi lebi şeker varun görüp bi ihtiyar oldum, kemendi zülfine yarın giriftav şikar oldum. When I saw his sugared lips, I lost all will. I was caught. Pray to the lasso of my beloved's ringlets. Leila Hanum too does not hesitate to sing his words in her divan. Gülşende saki, nuşu şerab bitmek isterem. O bezme murgu canı kebab bitmek isterem. Göstermez oldu aşıka olmak cemalini. Bir ah ile cihanı harab bitmek isterem. Cupbearer, I wish to drink wine in the rose garden. I wish to roast the bird of my soul for that party. 
That moon no longer reveals his beauty to the lover. So I wish to destroy the whole world with a star. Already in the 15th century, Zeynep Hatun had not only accepted the word of the male poet, she also articulated one of the most common patriarchal notions concerning women in the Islamic island Turkish society. The notion of women's greed and inferiority. Her following, Gazel reads, Keşfet nikabını yeri görüp nevvet, bu alemi anasını firdevsi enveret, depretle günü cuşa getir havzı kepseri, anber saçını çöz bu cihanı attar et. Hattun berat yazdı sabaya dedi ki tiz, var milketi hıta ile çiğni musahha et. Ağlı hayat olmayacak kısmet ey gönül, bin yıl gerekse hızrıla, Seyresi kenderit. Zeyle, kom eyli zineti dünyaya zen gibi, merdane var, sade dil ol, terkizi verit. I'm gonna read only the last part. <coughs> oh Zeyne, she tells herself, go simply, go bravely like a man. Surrender all decoration, surrender all decoration, abandon your love for this adorned, and deceiving world. In order to gain acceptance as a poet, this is a Persian word, like a man, a modest-hearted, spiritual, more transcendental human being, she accepts the dominant patriarchal judgment that women have some very negative features, like their fondness of this world of values, their weakness, their lack of spirituality. In, uh, in fact, the entire corpus of Ottoman Divan poetry is full of characterizations when references made to ordinary or run or non reified women. Generally speaking, the beloved was not referred in the Divans of the male elite using general or common words for the concept of woman, such as Kadın in Turkish or Zen in Persian. When Kadın or Zen were used in the Divans, they usually carried pejorative connotations. For the Ottoman Turkish poet, Kadın evoked such images as the cursed one, the inauspicious owl, scorpion, stupid, ignorant, evil, trickster, unfaithful, liar, shaitan, devil, and many, many other very undesirable epithets. Kadın, or Zen, for him, was a second-class human being, and this expression is taken from a manuscript second class human being, who should have been kept at home. Aşık Şerbi, in his meşail i Şuara, reports that Zeynep Hatun later gave up poetry, stopped her associations with other men, and finally came under the domination of her husband. This is presented as a more appropriate and virtuous kind of behavior on her part. The document reads exactly as follows. Zeynep ere varup, eri hükümünde olup, şiirden ve ricar ile musahibetten çekilmiş. Whether this was true or not, it clearly reveals the negative attitude that the Teskira writer had concerning Zeynep's efforts to write herself into men's club of poetry. We can assume that Aşık Çelebi's attitude also represented the opinion of other poets. Among the women poets who wrote medieval divan poetry, Mihri Khatun seems to be the most challenging female figure. She was born in the city of Amasya and died there in 1506. Mihri was the daughter of a Qadi, a poet himself, writing under the pseudonym of Belayi. She grew up listening to divan poetry and received a good education learning the canonical languages of the time, Arabic and Persian. She admired the poetry of the female, uh, of the famed Ottoman poet, male poet, Nejati. So much that she wrote Naziras, parallels to, gaz to his gazelles. Nejati, however, was apparently not very happy with a woman's attempt to write parallels, Naziras, to his acclaimed poetry. 
in an effort to articulate his dislike of such daring behavior and possibly to try uh, to try to drive this woman off the stage of classical poetry. He wrote the following kutfa. Ey benim şiklüme nazire diyen, çıkma rahı edepten eyle hazer. Deme ki işte vez bu kafiyede şiklüm oldu necatiye hemser. O you who could write parallels to my poems, do not, do not stray from the path of courtesy. Do not say my poems in rhyme and rhythm are as good as Nejati's. To have another poet write a nazire was normally a sign of respect and honor for the poet who was imitated. Here, however, we see a strong negative reaction to the imitator. What Mitri was seeking to achieve through the Naziris, her Naziris, was indeed to borrow the power of an already established and prestigious poet and his art in order to make her voice heard and to gain recognition as a poet. She purposely used this poetic form to call attention to and to legitimize her participation in this male-dominated artistic medium. Let us now see how she carried out this goal of benefiting from an already celebrated poet's discursive power by looking at one of her nazires. Ateşi gamda kebab oldu ciger döne döne, göklere çıktı duhanımda şerer döne döne. I'm just gonna read it in English for you. I know we are running out of time. The heart burned in the fire of grief, turning and twisting. The sparks with my smoky sighs reach the skies, turning and twisting. Griefing from your separation, the soul became a wick in the house of heart. Imagining you, the body became a burning lamp, turning and twisting. The sun and the moon came to your place, night and day, to bow before you, turning and returning. All oh, you, Venus forehead, the moon turned into a crescent, to look like your eyebrow turning and twisting. Look, to reach your crimson lips, the virtuous one walks down the road, tight rope thread of your love, turning and twisting. O oh, Mikri, since the pleasure of imagining the lips has struck that heart, it burned into the fire of grief, turning and twisting. This parallel to Najati's uh, very well known gazelle with the relief done turning and twisting is indeed a very successful rewriting and does not seem to depart from the usual way of composing a nazire. There is nothing in a nazire like this to elicit, to attract such an angry response from the male poet Nejati. According to according to the defteri müsveddat in amad ve tasadduqat ve teşrifat ve gayrihi Mitri Hatun received much more money from Bayezid II than did Nejati Bek. Thus, jealousy might explain her dis in the, his indignation in part. However, it seems obvious to me that Nejati Bek's anger still must have had something to do with gender. How could a woman receive more money from the Sultan than a man? And in addition, to any financial competition, Mitri was obviously overstepping some boundaries by manipulating the traditional and perfectly acceptable Nazire form to gain admission into an area from which she was normally excluded by gender. As I have already stated, Mitri Hatun was the first female voice to challenge the social, the literary constructs which marginalized women or relegated them to the role of a silenced and fetishized object of male desire. She not only forces her way into the gentleman's club of poetry, <coughs> she also objects to the idealized and reified image of the beloved, as it had been repeated time and time again. The following poem is a surprising an explicit rejection of the cliché beloved of the Imam poetry, which was the creation of male imaginings. I'm going to just put this transparency here. Uh, this is just to protect myself as a scholar, just in case you think, uh, you don't think that I wrote this myself. <laughs> When I discovered 
this in early one, I was happy like a five-year-old boy. That was the answer to many questions. In island poetry, critics usually in this field assume that reaction to classical poetry started with the French influence in the 19th century because of the values of modernity, putting down the classical values, or because of Marxist or nationalist ideologies which took place in the 19th and early 20th centuries in Turkey. But this is a poem written years ago, centuries ago, by a woman poet. Ne hüsnüm hafıtahu, ne hod mahı gencidur, ne kaşlarım kemanu, ne zülfüm nişancıdur. Bühtanlar eylemiş bize rana diyu hati, şairlerin bir nicesi gayet yalancıdur. La gıla buse istese, bizden aceb de gül, sakalı gelse her kişi iller gülüncüdür. Şimdiden gel makamı bizim buse'müze hemen, yıllerle yürek ağrısı, İshal rencidir. Her astane yüz sürüyüp bu secer rüder, bu bağ içinde mihri de senden dilencidir. What's so special about this one? Let's give the rough English translation of this. My beauty, she says, is neither like the sun, nor the treasured moon. My eyebrows are like the bow nor is my hair like the archer. The narrator has slandered me, calling me graceful, beautiful. Most of the poets are nothing but liars. If she asks for a kiss from me in jest, I wouldn't be surprised. He, is, he whose face is dark with stubble is made fun of by everyone. From now on, his place is my kiss, but also my but also the pain of rheumatism, diarrhea, I don't know the French word, and heartache. He bows before every doorway begging for a kiss. In this doorway, Mihri is begging you too. This may be world's first love lyric on is how diarrhea, written by a woman poet in German. Like her usage of the Nazire, Mihri bases her poem again upon a very conventional idea coming from a perfectly safe and authoritative source. The Quran itself condemns poets as liars. As Surah uh, Although this is not in any way a religious poem, Mihri seizes this opportunity to combine the religious denunciation with a document, with a commentary on the falsity of the canonized images of the beloved in classical poetry. She fills the beginning of her gazelle with traditional images, but only to negate their validity. She shatters the reified and idealized woman of the male canon with her mention of the very graphic bodily sufferings of a real human being. The male poet Lover traditionally expressed his emotional anguish with physical and bodily metaphors, but she ridicules these conventions with her exaggeratedly indecent images. She mocks the entire uh, persona of the supplicating lover, just like everyone makes fun of the man with, a, with his stubble beard. <coughs> it is quite amazing to see such criticism of Divan poetry which is normally associated with the 19th and early 20th century agendas of modernity, coming here from a 15th century moon poet. When we say 19th century criticism, I just want to summarize what I mean by this, by placing these two transparencies here. Once I collected some of these images of classical poetry, Right, the poet has everything he needs to write to compose love lyrics. He's going to talk about stature. Here we go. Servi, Tuba, Araf, Nihal, etc., etc. Face, Shams, Mihr, Aftab, Ma, etc. Mole, eyes, eyebrows, coquettish glance, mouth, teeth, lips, hair, everything he needs. 
His vocabulary is very difficult for a Turk, a native speaker of Turkish. But this vocabulary is easy for the insider, the poet, the intellectuals, because it is limited in many ways. And modernists have criticized this poet for a long time, and they have a certain point, of course, for not dealing with real issues of this world. Politics, right? People are oppressed. You cannot talk about these issues in this poetry. And an Azerbaijani, 19th century modernist, humanist poet, put all these images together, came up with this beloved of Divan poetry, Turkish beloved. And he said, hey, look at this lady, look at this woman. This is the image, this is the woman, the master, that the poets talked about for a long time, at least 600 years in Turkey, and before that, centuries in Iran. Of course, he does not contextualize things. Uh, if this poetry was uh, as funny as this, as meaningless, as useless as this image, then I would assume that those poets who wrote the one poetry for 600 years were stupid. They had nothing to do and talk about one image. It's not acceptable. But yes, it's a great representation of the modernist interpretation of classical poetry. Going back to the question that I asked earlier, how could a woman in a patriarchal society based so predominantly on religious norms and class distinctions write poetry or just write period in a poetic tradition dominated by aesthetic taste and ideology of the male elite? What I have presented so far would make it clear that instead of trying to come up with a totally female or a poetic tradition, the impossibility of which they must have recognized. The upper class Ottoman woman who wanted to become classical poets had to find other ways of acceptance. And for this, they had to negotiate in a very clever way. One of the most effective techniques of this negotiation was what I have cited above, trying to write like him, using his words, expressing his fantasies, but at the same time, by means of such a strategy, taking some of the power away from the male elite's hegemony over writing and literary aesthetics. At least by singing his words, the woman poets borrowed power from this discourse and the prestige it maintains in that culture. In this way, there were, to some extent, in John's terms, destabilizing the gender system, which systematically excluded them from writing. First of all, even if we assume that these women did not in any way add anything to this male design, phallocentric literary discourse, and merely imitated them, it still can be considered a disturbance to the dominant patriarchal system. The medieval Ottoman women poets adopted the canonized language of classical poetry as one of the techniques of this negotiation, even though it was designed to express only male desires and fantasies. This compromise was the shortest way for them to gain entrance into the club. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for your patience. I would be happy to take some questions. Thank you. <coughs> <laughs> well, we, we thank you very much, Sir, uh, for this uh, <coughs> very interesting uh, talk and uh, a talk which I think has uh, transported us to uh, a, uh, an ideal world. It's a uh, uh, lyric poetry uh, by women, okay, which is, uh, as I see it, uh, more about uh, peaceful relationships uh, between men and women. So in his uh, lecture, uh, Dr. Silai has uh, first presented, uh, he has talked about how women have uh, uh, recuperated uh, the way uh, the main po uh, poets were writing. Okay, they have recuperated or sort of imitated uh, 
their use of uh, language and uh, cliches, and uh, the uh, in a, uh, in a singing uh, or reciting this kind of poetry, uh, they have uh, uh, become subjects uh, instead of uh, being uh, objects in the past. They have been objects of uh, main poet's desire. Now, in reciting uh, this kind of lyric poetry, <coughs> uh, they have uh, uh, gained a voice and they have uh, become the uh, subjects. Uh, so, uh, we thank you very much and uh, we ask the audience uh, to, uh, uh, to ask any question or give me any wish. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I have some questions, right? It was a long paper. No? Yes. yes. Well, uh, perhaps my question will be straightforward, but... Uh, That's okay. Yeah, uh, I noticed that at the beginning you uh, insisted or you uh, focused on uh, French criticism. I mean, uh, feminist French criticism. Yes. And uh, of course we know that French... Uh, <coughs> feminist criticism insists on this notion of the fathers as the most important yes. you know, aspect in, uh, in the conflict between uh, women and uh, men writings. Uh, so my question is to what extent does this help understand the uh, Ottoman or the Turkish poetry? I mean, uh, does it reveal or does it confirm what the French say about... Uh, I think it uh, simply challenges what the French is saying. Uh, especially in the United States, uh, you can only imagine that we don't have big audiences for Arabic literature, Persian literature, Turkish literature. So, uh, in Turkey, I can simply come up with a monography of a particular poet and don't need to really theorize the whole thing. I can uh, stay at a very local uh, stage. But in the United States, especially, uh, we are required to uh, deal with things in a universal uh, context. So by uh, adopting uh, the, the theories of Andrew Zorn and Jones, for example, who is very different from the French critics who, who seem to be uh, obsessed with, as you put, phallus, and, and uh, try to uh, explain everyone's sexuality in every country based on the French experience in Paris, uh, she challenges that. And uh, by uh, talking about the French in the beginning and criticizing them towards the end and presenting the, the Turkish case, again, reinforcing this criticism, I think I try to, or I try to uh, bring a comparative literary perspective to uh, a quite local subject, quite limited subject, which is Ottoman poetry. But I do agree with you that their position because this is, I think, this is an aspect, and sorry to, uh, to talk uh, too much. If there is any question, please. But I just want to uh, to say that um, this is a problem in, in criticism in general, mm -hmm. is that we try to uh, to take one of the theories and impose them on, on, on some writings, and I think this is the danger, especially when we, we uh, read uh, French uh, deconstructionist theory, you know, concerning especially uh, uh, women writings, we see that the focus is really on the fathers, whereas I think it depends on the context, and uh, yes. we have to readjust these theories, and perhaps even uh, refuse them and question them. So but I can't agree with you more. I mean, yes, there are, especially in the States, I'm sure in France too, every other day there is a new book on literary uh, theory or feminism. Uh, to the extent that they don't even use the term feminism anymore, feminisms. I mean, you have an incredible concept of production for production's sake. Uh, and none of these theories almost come from, let's say, the, the Middle East. I mean, we do, and you do have your own literary traditions. We do have our own literary traditions in Turkey, in Iran, in other parts of the, of, uh, the Middle East and Central Asia. But none of these local experiences what they call the other experiences, have any place in the development of these philosophical theories. So in, uh, to a certain extent, I think it is uh, our job 
to uh, get to know these Western theories very well, but not simply repeat them, but to constantly modify them and challenge them. So I cannot agree with you more, and that's what I have been trying to do. Yes, please. Uh, I would like you to, to, to tell me something about this idea of negotiation that is introduced by Rosa Chinese. And don't you think that this, uh, this uh, by imitating, for instance, you have been talking about uh, women poets as imitating uh, men, if you want to, or male poets, and by doing this delay, as you said, destabilize, for instance, yes. their patriarchy. But as far as I can see, and uh, maybe it's a uh, uh, some uh, feminist process, especially male, uh, pro-feminists, uh, this doesn't mean that uh, they have uh, they are trying to establish or to reinforce the space they are power, but these male pro-feminists think that by doing this, for instance, by uh, by repeating or by by imitating for instance, or by as you said, using men's language. They may not only reinforce, but maybe repeat the same history of repression or of oppression. Because, as maybe you mentioned, uh, I think uh, Helen Six's response is talking about the uh, Paris as, uh, as the pen, or, and uh, she said that we have to write, and that women should write their own body should use their own language instead of imitating, uh, for instance, uh, men's uh, writing or men's language. And this is uh, maybe a theoretical problem because uh, maybe it's uh, no, this is uh, something that, uh, that is uh, completely solved that maybe we are not expecting this to be solved as a sort of um, uh, algebraic problem or something mm -hmm. like this. But uh, it is a problematic process in, in feminism, especially for women. And this is, they just try to, to, find, to find something new, for instance, and maybe this idea of the French feminists. Uh, in, uh, in the, they would uh, uh, describe it all, they uh, considered as radicals, some of them. But uh, maybe Kestiva is uh, an, an exception. Because she talks about this uh, semiotic cora, and semiotic cora may, may, uh, may apply if you want to these poets, especially female poets, because it has to do with this uh, inarticulate pre, uh, pre verbal if you want, production. And maybe this uh, uh, uh, poetry is something that has this type of uh, aspect, because especially for uh, female uh, poets, because they, they are involved in a sort of struggle or conflict to, to find their own uh, uh, speech. And in this way, maybe Christina's uh, view is maybe more positive because she doesn't, she's not that radical and doesn't make this uh, clear cut you know, the division between the two sexes as male or female, but she, she opts for a sort of uh, uh, midway Point. And so the, this idea of negotiation, this idea of for women to establish their own uh, their own feet, their own language, don't you think that this imitation may only repeat his story, as we said, or repeat his history? I think, uh, I understand what you're saying. I'm not trying to uh, go and see, try to find a feminine, pure, purely feminine voice in the medieval texts uh, written in Turkey in Turkish. Uh, when you read the Irigata as this, this sex, which is not one, I mean, she's in the 21st century trying to create a, a feminine writing, and she's doing experimental things. But we can never imagine the same kind of experimentations from the past, even from the men. I mean, even, we don't even have men as a political power, as, as a social being, so free in this discourse because the canon dominates everything. What Ellen uh, Jones, Rosalind Jones tries to do is really actually uh, escaping from the, the sexual concentration of the French feminists in general. 
she is a Marxist feminist uh, critic, and she tries to see uh, the writing of the past in Europe, especially the Renaissance, as a social activity, as a socio-political activity, not as a sexual activity. And from this point of view, uh, I found her approach uh, quite useful to uh, what was going on in Turkey during the Middle Ages, even in the 19th century, when all those, uh, all those uh, activities of modernity and nationalism were taking place. Even in uh, today's Turkey, you have uh, several modernist movements. You have reactions from the Islamic fundamentalists, what they call, or Islamic revival. Uh, you have still, uh, as a result of the Kurdish uprising in the East, you have the reaction, uh, uh, almost the reborn of, of the Kemalist ideology. And, and dealing with a society like that, where uh, in which uh, literature and the beyond and, and politics was always tied so closely, I think it would be a useless preoccupation for me. Uh, it would be a, a luxury, a, a quite bourgeois activity to focus on the follows and nothing else. So for, from that point of view, I found uh, Anne's theories uh, much closer to what I am trying to do. But of course, I would never, never try to imitate Jones from that point of view. Simply copy her, translate her into Turkish, or uh, you know, re-articulate her in, in my book, uh, and voila, I have the theory established for Adam and woman. There is no such thing. Constantly uh, modifying what she said. <coughs> Thank you so for uh, your question. Uh, my uh, question is uh, about uh, the, uh, the woman's uh, position in uh, the patriarchal world or uh, whether in uh, uh, the oriental uh, world. Uh, don't you think that in uh, the oriental world a uh, woman is subordinated by considering her as a sexual object or uh, as a machine just to produce uh, children, uh, which excludes her from uh, the world of literature? Uh, I couldn't hear you well, that's probably why I couldn't understand you well, uh, but uh, do you exactly mean the Ottoman Turkish woman, let's say, that the subject is, saw themselves as, uh, what did you say, the children producing? Uh, in, the, in the patriarchal world. Patriarchal world. So, in other words, do you mean, were they realizing where they were living? Is that how? Uh, we consider uh, is uh, uh, uh, in the Oriental world. Do we consider the woman as a, uh, just as a sexual object or as a child huh. machine to produce children? Okay. Uh, this view uh, excludes her from the world of education. Uh, okay. First of all, if I could kindly warn you about one thing. Uh, by saying the oriental world, or we, right? Do you yes. know what I mean? We, the oriental world? You know, that is quite a Western uh, indoctrination. You are the Orient, we are the Orientalists. We are going to tell you how you think, what your history is, what your literature is. We are the experts. So, by kindly refusing what you use, I'm not going to use the term oriental or the oriental world. You know, what is the oriental world? What is the Arab world? Right? Alam al-Arabi, Alam al turki people say the same thing. There are different cultures, right, within the Arab cultures, in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, right, Islamic cultures, and Turkic cultures, Uzbeks, Kazakhs, Kurds, Turks of Turkey, uh, or Turks in Morocco right now, they have different cultures. And uh, how do we see women as sexual objects, uh, just simple objects, uh, who could help us produce children so we can, you know, continue the generations? I would only answer your question by saying, who do we think we is? Depends on who you ask. If you ask me, I don't see Turkish woman or any other woman as sexual objects or just simple uh, objects uh, to produce children. No, I don't. They are. Social beings just like me. 
but there could be other answers from other uh, oriental societies uh, to this question. I hope I was able to answer. If not, I, am up. I apologize. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, lecture. Uh, lecture. My pleasure. Uh, do you think, uh, do you think that uh, we can speak about uh, uh, women uh, literature in, uh, uh, as we know that it is controlled by the, the men, men's, uh, men's uh, ideology? Can we speak about uh, uh, female, uh, female uh, literature? Can we speak about female literature? You mean in the past during the Middle Ages? Now, now, in, the, now in the, especially in Turkey now. In, a... in Turkey, uh, yes, I mean, but do, when I write a book, do people refer to what I wrote? Oh, another uh, male literature which is just out. Uh, or when I read Yashar Kemal Nasim Hikmet, do, do I see him as a man? Like, let me go and read the man poet today. No. But there are a lot of poets who happen to be born as women, who struggle, at least in today's Turkey, almost what Ken Jones uh, describes as the third level of negotiation. You are challenging the, uh, the ideology, the main ideology in society. You're trying to subverse things. You are in a more uh, struggling position than obedience, or trying to find very kind, secure ways of challenging. Yes, in today's Turkey, there are women uh, who try to create a woman's literature or who, uh, feminisms of different kinds. There are women uh, in, at major Turkish universities who believe in the Islamic uh, ideology or Islamic way of living, and they create their own uh, Islamic literature based on Islamic values. There are women who believe in the, the freedom, what they call, the, the freedom that modernity or Kemalism uh, or nationalism in the 20th century gave them. And they are trying to create a Kemalist literature, praising the founder of modern Turkey, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. There are women who don't do any of these things, but simply read a lot of French stuff and translate them into Turkish and focus on their sexuality. They claim that uh, early modern, uh, modern modernist ideologies in Turkey, and even today, turn them into sex, sexless comrades of the republic. Because they say, they for example claim, if you go to the, uh, the, the villages of Turkey, you're not gonna see anything but women who dress up black and white or gray. Where is pink? Where is blue? Where is the feminine sexuality? That's how they see it. But there are also women uh, who try to establish uh, and socialist uh, feminist writing. But can I call these things as women's writing? I don't think I can. By looking at the language, I cannot distinguish. But I know that the name is, uh, I know the author, I can contextualize today where she is, what she does, and I might uh, approach it as women's writing. Yes, please. I have two questions. Uh, yes. The first one is uh, how uh, uh, how can we get rid of uh, of this position? Because uh, if we if we go back to our uh, to the the human history and its uh, evolution, we say that uh, in the matriarchal system there was no uh, there was no uh, uh, the uh, the woman and man uh, used to be uh, the the producers of. Uh, of uh, the daily consumer goods of their society. And uh, the, the, the woman uh, used to have uh, great respect because, uh, she, uh, because she, she, she, uh, she gave, she gave uh, children to the tribe which were the continuation of it. Of it. So uh, how can we, uh, if we read it historically, uh, we see that uh, uh, when, we, when, we, when the woman has, uh, had lost, has lost, uh, her uh, economical role, she she had be, uh, she she she has become to to suffer from this position this position. Uh, so uh, I think that's my my my question is clear. And, uh, so do you want to keep the system, or you're asking me how can we? Yeah, how can we get rid of, of this position? So how can we get rid of the historical position which continues? Is that what you're asking? No. Or how can we get rid of the modern position? Patriarchy system. 
Uh, but how do you again define patriarchal system? Like producing, making, forcing yeah. women economically produce, produce children? No, it's not producing children. To to take role in in society, in economy. Because mm -hmm. when when the woman uh, has lost uh, her, her economical uh, position, she uh, if we read it historically, we see that uh, this is a uh, data. Uh -huh. yes, and the the, the second uh, my second question uh, when uh, when a professor ha has a uh, speak uh, spoke about uh, theory. Uh, I ask what the question: Which comes first, the the the thought or uh, the reality? Which comes first, the yeah. thought or the reality? In other words, which comes first, practice or theory? Yes. Theory or practice? Historical uh, question. Which comes first, chicken? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you ask me some tough questions. Uh, the historicity. Uh, you have some history in mind, obviously some kind of history. But can we really talk about history uh, from a universal point of view? What is history for Moroccan society? What is history for French society? What, what, what is human history? Who wrote history? Who still writes history? The women writes history. Uh, when it comes to women, are we, all we have, if all we have is these pieces of histories, bits and pieces of histories written predominantly by men and giving us the position of women, right, in the past, then my instinct tells me be suspicious at all because they were not uh, actively contributing, in, at least in some societies, uh, to the writing of histories. For, uh, for example, uh, when it comes to Turkish history, uh, people, there are a lot of people uh, who try to juxtapose the position of women uh, in, during the Islamic period versus pre-Islamic period. You know, Turks became Muslims around the 9th century. And they, those scholars claim that uh, women enjoyed uh, a greater, much greater freedom before Islam before they accepted Islam. But of course, this is a programmatic approach, I realize it. Then uh, the 90% Muslim Turkish population will have reactions to this. What do you mean? Of course, Islam gave rights to women. Of course, uh, they were slaves before. With the introduction of Islam, uh, you know, women uh, got more power than they ever were. Depending on your political position, whatever you believe in, you will have enough data, I am sure, to support your position. I only recommend, uh, I hate to sound French, but let us enjoy our reference. And let us uh, keep the civilized level of, uh, of, of uh, criticism, of discussion, of theory. When it comes to uh, you know, these disagreements sometimes in some societies, as we see in Algeria, in Turkey, in Iran, can get quite bloody. And who's right? They all have their arguments. And when I listen to their arguments, I am, I'm, I'm satisfied with those uh, data they present to me. But of course, I have my own position. And uh, ah, let me go back to theory, uh, which comes first, uh, theory or practice or facts. Uh, again, the fact, you know, they know the question is idea of fact, what is fact? who decides what fact is. Uh, I'm not going to go into that that much, but uh, to me, uh, to be honest with you, especially growing up in Turkey, uh, with in many difficulties, uh, to me, practice comes first. No theory should and can make sense without practice. If I am unable to go to Turkey and live with those people and read their literature, and contextualize that literature within the socio-political events that are taking place. My theories will not make any any uh, sense at all. I believe in the function of theories. Otherwise, I could just simply enjoy my beautiful golden chair in the uh, United States and go to Turkey and stay in the Hilton Hotel for a couple of days and come back and theorize the Turks. 
sometimes uh, Western colleagues of mine uh, make me a little mad. They tell me, oh, I was in Istanbul a few weeks ago. I had the loveliest time there. What did you do? I was in the new Open Hilton. It was a beautiful hotel, excellent food, luxury like crazy. And these people did not go there with the little, you know, with the people of those little villages in southeastern Turkey, eastern Turkey, in central Anatolia, and so their lifestyles. And the scholars come back and write, uh, develop theories about anthropology in Turkey, sociology of Turkish society. That I don't believe. They should be together. But first, practice should come. My I'm sorry, if you could repeat it slowly. Yeah. How yeah. men? Yeah. How does man consider uh, women? Okay. Especially in Turkish society. In modern Turkish society. Yeah. This is the first part of my question. Do you think, sir, that uh, women are different in their manner of writing, or there is something which is common? I mean, the Turkish women and Moroccan. Thank you for the question. I wish uh, I were qualified enough to talk about Moroccan women and their writings. Uh, someday, hopefully. And uh, this is my very first time here, and unfortunately, I didn't have access uh, before to the literature produced in, in Morocco by women or by men. Very little. Uh, someday, hopefully, I'll be able to try to do that. Uh, in terms of the question, how do men see? Women in Turkey, they can. Uh, you, know, you can go to Turkey, take an airplane, land in Istanbul, take a taxi, go downtown, you're in a different world. Take a bus, travel for two hours, stop by, have some tea. You will find a brand new society somewhere, so different. You keep going. It's, it's a big enough country, a little bigger than France. But there are, I would say, literally hundreds of different cultures, what we call today Republic of Turkey, or Anatolia, or Turkey. You know the history of the Latin Osmania. When the Ottoman Empire collapsed, there were 50 some nations, 50 some nations, millets or entities living in that land. The nationalism comes, uses language as one of the ways of putting these societies, these different entities, different millets together, based on nationalism. But these people still continue their, their cultures. Not officially, but these cultures still continue. So again, I cannot totalize. Am I the representative of Turkish men from Turkey right now? No. No way. Is my father's? Absolutely not. Are my friends from Istanbul, Ankara? No. Depends on the social class, the, uh, the religious status of the person, the economic status of the person, the educational level, the regional, their uh, background, linguistic background, cultural backgrounds. Depends on who you ask. But if you're asking me how the official ideology in Turkey is uh, making the Turkish men see Turkish women, then I can answer that question. Official ideology, uh, modernist ideology, uh, focuses on the equality of men and women. A woman can practically, practically become the, the president of the country, and that was the case a few years ago. Uh, there are women professors uh, all over the universities. Uh, there is nothing that a woman cannot do in Turkey that a man does, especially on an official level. But if you go to villages, uh, if you ask my father whether my mother can do anything she wants, he'll say, absolutely no. Yeah, probably. Because is he a backward medieval man? No, that's his culture. 
That's how an eagle was. Does my mother actually go to night clubs and drink wine every night with other men? Is she sorry that she's missing this? No. That's her way of living. That's her values. If you ask her, she feels sorry for the woman who's spending uh, all their uh, days in nightclubs and drinking wine and arak and smoking cigarette in public. If you ask her, she feels sorry for them. If you ask the modern woman, they feel extremely sorry for my mom and they try to save her depending on your position. Thank you. Thank you for <coughs> Yes, please. Thank you very much for your interesting lecture. Thank you. Um, my question is, uh, don't you think that the poems of uh, the Turkish women is in a way or not, is not eclectic? It, doesn't, it, it is not uh, diversity, diversified. It does not this variety of subjects. It is only concerned, specialized only, uh, talking about uh, love, sexuality, and, uh, you know, there is no variety of subjects. It's, uh, they don't concern themselves, for example, political issues, criticism, or something. Well, they could not. Even men couldn't until the 19th century. Because this, I mean, of course, there are different genres or different poetic traditions, like Kaside, right? Like, like Mahdavi. Uh, it's not just Kazakh. But the tradition, the court tradition, this is the literature produced at the Iron Court, Sarai Osman, and for the Iron Court. These poets, the majority of them, were sponsored, were supported by the Sultan. And you know, every Ottoman Sultan had to do something uh, when he's you know, free from killing the Kufar in the battlefield, he had to write some poetry on wine, on mysticism, on, or just simply be a jeweler, do some kind of art. That was the tradition of the time. There was no place or need for political uh, expression in literature. But in the 19th century, uh, with the uh, first modernist movements in Turkey, even though the early poets, modernist poets, used classical forms to, uh, in, in composition, uh, not only just the free verse, they did uh, start talking about political issues freedom, etc. And in the uh, 20th century, Turkish literature, particularly the poetry, became the poetry, the edebiyat or edeb of politics, and especially Marxist Leninist poetry. And after the 1980 military coup, September 12, 1980, that was the last military coup in Turkey. Uh, all leftist poets, I think, uh, were suppressed, and especially, I mean, when you have the when you see the death of the Soviet Union too, uh, Turkish, Turkish Marxists started to apologize uh, that they were deceived by the Soviets, and little by little, more and more capitalism entered the society, and voila, the Turks uh, discovered postmodernism or post-modernism, uh, they are trying to now uh, enjoy their differences and uh, buy uh, brand new cars and uh, live uh, like more and more like uh, Westerners, an upper-class uh, lifestyle. Poetry, I think, after the 1980s, lost, not forever, but to a great extent, lost its uh, political power. And for the Ottoman centuries, uh, going back to your question, it's impossible to do anything like that, with the exception of the 19th century. So the woman did exactly what men did when it comes to the expression of uh, politics. I hope I made sense. Thank you. Turkish uh, women were influenced 
by uh, this uh, Arabic uh, first uh, writing in this subject. There is not and not uh, just uh, for example self, uh, self uh, imposing, as you said, that the, the, these Turkish women, uh, because they belong to a smart uh, society, they have more freedom. They can uh, uh, write in these uh, subjects. Don't you think that uh, there is an Arabic influence? Uh, I wish I could. I wish I could prove that there was an influence. It is likely, but not very likely. Why? Even when it comes to understanding, reading, understanding, analyzing, interpreting, the poetry written by men in Turkey, we don't usually focus on the Arabic influence when it comes to poetry, official language perhaps, Arabic, but it was, I would say, predominantly Persian. So the first place uh, is to go and look at the divans written by Iranian poets. That was, uh, that was the dominant tradition. So for that reason, of course, I cannot speak by, for sure. I would uh, be a little hesitant to accept an uh, Arab influence. But if someone can show this to me, I would be very, very happy look at it, to incorporate it. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. So thank you for your questions and thank you for your questions.